Hello and welcome to another episode of Django Chat. This week we're joined by Katie McLaughlin, who wears many hats in the Python Django world, director of Python Software Foundation, also director of Django Software Foundation, the conference director for PyCon Australia, and currently at Google. Katie, welcome to the show. Hi. So there's so much we want to talk about. Um, maybe we'll just start with the classic, how did you get into programming? So <laughs> that is a story. Um, one of the first things that really got me interested with computers and what they can do in general was I had a Windows 3.1 machine in my garage that my dad had for reasons. And I worked out that you could change the colors of the theming to be glarish colors, um, which is now known as hot dog theme. Um, <laughs> but from there, I... Um, I didn't really get started into any programming stuff until really high school where one of the end of year classes they offered was a intro to HTML programming in Microsoft Word. Um, the next year I picked up a book on HTML, learnt tables, and from there just started getting involved in like working out how JavaScript works, taking the ICT class in final years of high school, then finding a, a way to be able to do a university course as part of high school and then getting a Bachelor of Information Technology and then getting a job and then jumping to so many different languages. And now I am apparently one of the directors of a foundation or two foundations to do with technology. And okay, this is fine. Um, <laughs> so what's that What's that path like? I mean, again, because you, you wear so many hats in the community, how how did that come about? I mean, how does, you know, among the other people who are directors and conference organizers, is there a similar um, path of how they get there or does it really vary for everyone? For me, it started out with helping carry beer and setting out tables at the meetups that um, one of my previous employers hosted at the time. And from there going, huh, maybe I could speak at one of these things. And then huh, maybe this is interesting. Maybe I should give a talk about this. And then, oh, I got accepted for a talk in New Zealand. Okay, this is fine. Um, and then just being around and volunteering to help, something as simple as um, making sure that a speaker is introduced and that I make sure that people ask questions in the form of a question and then realizing that there's a whole lot of opportunities around helping on boards and councils and making myself somewhat popular because popularity voting is absolutely a thing. Um, I mean, is there an infinite <laughs> list of people who want to donate all the time and energy, though, that, that you and these other organizers do? Because... I mean, that's something I, I hope we can talk about um, today is just how much work and how many volunteers are involved in any conference, because I, I, I was just at PyCon for the first time, and that's overwhelming. But there's an overwhelming amount of yeah work behind the scenes to make it so smooth that you, you know, more than anyone since of all the hats you wear, have, have a sense. So how does, like, how does that break down, for example, as a conference organizer? What's, what's the sort of ratio of... Um, you know, attendees to volunteers to like, like, how do you keep track of it all in your head? Right. Cause there's so much going on at any one conference. It's PyCon US in Cleveland in like the last week, as we record this going off into um, Pittsburgh next year, there is an entire horde of volunteers, everything from the session chairs and session runners to the people who help stuff the swag bags to the people who help organize any of the summits all the way up to the paid staff because people get paid in the Python world and they are funded by the PSF and the PSF has actual staff members because one of the things with volunteering is that there are some tasks that you really cannot get a volunteer to do <laughs> and yeah. financial accounting for a nonprofit with how many millions going in and out is not something you dump on a volunteer yeah. and paying people for that like professional work is absolutely a thing, but it's also a case of many hands make light work and volunteering for a three hour session chairing thing. And a couple of dozen people doing that just makes the entire thing run so much smoother. Um, because 
it would be great if we could give everyone compensation for their time, but we can also give a hearty handshake and a strong felt thank you, which is for some people more than enough. But yeah, right. Yeah. Well, and it's and um, I mean, for me at PyCon, so I I volunteered to uh, do conference check in, and that's also just a great way to meet people for for anyone if it's your first conference or you're new to a conference. Um, you know, you're all, it's there to, it's there to meet people. So stuffing bags, you know, just there's always going to be a list of volunteering opportunities, which is as good a chance as anything to uh, to meet a lot of people. So encourage yeah. people to do that. Um, well, before we get more into conferences. Uh, you mentioned you've done a lot of different programming languages. Can you talk about the shift to Python and Django, which is where um, you've, I think you still are, or talk about, you know, in a professional sense, how, how are these things used, right? What's the, what's the vibe? Because everyone listening knows Python and Django, but they probably also use different programming languages. Yeah, so um, my first professional job, I was working with Oracle Application Express. Oh, wow. Which okay. sounds very enterprise and it is. Um, <laughs> but due to a series of events, I have been um, employed as a software developer in a, not a junior, not a senior, but as a, oh, I can eventually learn the language and then get stuff done. Um, so I was doing PowerShell for a while, and then I was doing Ruby for a while. Um, but the first conference talk I gave internationally was at Linux Conference Australia and Linux Conference Australia is part of Linux Australia and Linux Australia runs other events including WordPress um, WordCamps including DrupalCon and including PyCon Australia which it was strongly suggested was a very good event that I should attend not having a lick of Python in me I submitted <laughs> a talk and it oh, got wow. accepted good, good for good for you yeah I, I even like somehow, and I'll need to check my own git commit history for this, I did submit and publish a package in Python before my first PyCon by reading the docs and working it out. And then some very marvelous people made sure that my code wasn't terrible and ported it to Python 3 for me. And it, I did not know a lot back then but I still don't know a lot, but I know a little bit more. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know what you don't know. <laughs> yeah, the, the community is really what's kept me in the Python world. And I've also given a keynote about how literally the community has kept me in the Python world because I deal with a whole bunch of brain chemistry issues and the people that I've met in the Python community have kept me going and are wonderful people. And I enjoy getting to see them a lot and making sure that I'm around is a thing that helps. Yeah. And so when when um professionally did you were you able to work with let's say let's say Django, right? Was there um have you been able to do that for a while or that was I think only at the, at Divio most recently? Technically, I've never been employed to work with Django. Um at huh. Divio I was a site reliability engineer. Mm -hmm. So I was paid to help keep the Django's running, but I have not been paid to professionally develop in Django. And yet I am a now two year serving board member of the Django Software <laughs> Foundation. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. But that's also okay. Like you don't have to be, well, you don't have to be Carlton to be able to serve on these things, to be able to help <laughs> the community. Um, I mean, every community needs a Carlton or 12, but yep. not everyone has to be a Carlton. Yeah. Do you, do you remember, um, you know, so learning Django, this is a question I like to ask people because, you know, most people, whether people have come from a previous web development background or not, tends to have a big impact on how they view Django. I'm curious for you. I, I assume you'd, you'd done some other web stuff before you touched Django for the first time? Yeah. I mean, um, I have developed in Ruby on Rails before. I have been paid to do that. Um I've also done the odd Sinatra app or Flask app here and there. But most of the way that I learned how to use Django, I mean, I still don't know a lot about it, but the bits that I had to learn was the stuff that helped me in a system administration sense. So literally there is a Django app that's playing up. How do I go in and work out what's wrong? And, oh, there's a Django shell. What is that? And what is an ORM? And how do I manipulate this? And I gave a talk at DjangoCon US 2018 where I described 
literally going from my Oracle roots and my SQL knowledge into how that maps to the ORM, which is a learning process that is absolutely valid, being able to use generic skills like SQL and being able to apply that to domain-specific information like the Django ORM and knowing that there are similarities and how that maps to each other as a diving board into the great unknown. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we'll link to that that talk because that I, I would say that yeah the ORM the more time I spend with Django that's the part that is the most in, interesting but still a little mysterious. Um, I feel like that in some ways maybe has the greatest depth. Um, I mean even uh, Tim Graham who we had on um, as a guest said that was the one area that he felt he didn't have mastery though you know, take that with a grain of salt when Tim says that. So uh, another thing you've um, talked about is um, deployments, which this is something Carlton and I often talk about. Um, so I'm curious, you know, you've done some talks. What are your what are your thoughts on Django deployments before I <laughs> give mine? So, I mean, I've worked at Divio where their product is hosted Django as a service. I now work at Google where there are many different ways that you can host your Django. Um, I was accepted, but sadly could not attend DjangoCon Europe, where I was going to give a talk entitled, What is Deployment Anyway? Good so question. I haven't actually written that talk yet. Um, <laughs> but there is absolutely a stepping stone from, I've completed the Django Girls tutorial to, so where do I host this now? And going from there, what is the best way to host production level ready and scalable Django? And what is 12 factor? And what is serverless? And why do I care? And because I have a very strong operations background, not just a development background, I am able to talk both languages and be able to help convey the TLDR from the <laughs> operations world for developers because hopefully in most situations it's not just the developer having to do all this stuff but when it is you don't need to know the entire spectrum you just need to know enough to get your job done mm -hmm. and hopefully if if that talk gets accepted anywhere we'll be able to update these show notes to a link to it once i give it um yeah now well and i think that's part of the the thing that's confusing for people learning Django is that they're just assuming they have to do everything. So they have to handle all the deployments. You know, if it's full stack Django, they have to learn JavaScript and all these things. And they're, you know, the reality is most Django engineers are focused on Django, focused on backend APIs and have an awareness or can dive in as needed, but do not have all of this in their head um, at all the levels required. So it's- And that it's, is absolutely fine. You do not have to know everything. I hope that anyone listening to this doesn't have to be in that position where they are the one-stop shop, that they have co-workers and colleagues who have the specializations to help them with that. However, it is also very useful to know what those folks are doing. And yeah. so this is DevOps. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, there's, a it's reason, not... there's a reason it exists too. That's why I always tell people to like, you yeah. know, sometimes I'll, I'll be out of my depth on some production thing. And it's like, well, you know, DevOps is a career for a reason. Like. <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, speaking of DevOps, I've helped to run a DevOps days before, as yes, well as I've been that. employed as a DevOps, which is an interesting job title, because clearly DevOps is a plural. I am but a single person. So obviously I'm a DevOps. Oh, that's yeah. true. I hadn't thought about that. Yes. Huh. Well, that's like with, well, yeah, with a lot of language, if you think too much about it, it doesn't make sense. Um, so one thing that I thought might be interesting to talk about is um, what you see as the similarities and differences in these various communities that you're so involved with. So PyCon Australia, and then maybe even the DSF versus the PSF. Because, um, you know, even for me, I only have a vague sense of <laughs> what these organizations are and do. Um, but you, you know, you have that experience. I'm curious what, you know, pro, not pros and cons, but just what are the sort of similarities and differences um, that you've noticed? Conferences are all about providing a platform for people to share ideas and for very successful conferences, it turns into a space that turns into a annual pilgrimage for the community to join together and fly halfway across the world to listen mm -hmm. to people, to share ideas, to learn. And it is 
absolutely something that a bunch of the um, languages that I've used don't really have. Like I'm not aware of a lot of um, such events like PyCons for the Java world. I'm sure they exist. I'm sure that there are many people who attend like um, OzCons or All Things Open where it's not language specific, but just the sheer scale of how many PyCons there are around the world yeah. means that there is nearly always one close to you, which is so important, especially for those who can't travel. Yeah, it's interesting because I always think, I largely think of how software is being used. So like there's RailsConf and stuff, but maybe there's a RubyConf. Um, Python there is, is a RubyConf in Australia. There's a RubyConf in New Zealand. There is has been a RubyConf in Malaysia, and that's just in my little neck of the woods. There are RubyConfs <laughs> around the place, but there are – there's the PyCon.org is a newly relaunched and revamped website from the PSF that lists all the PyCons, including a calendar of all the PyCons, and – just in June alone, there is one, two, three, four, five, six events and at least one Django Girls event in Israel, in London, in the Czech Republic, in the US, in Switzerland, in Colombia, just in June. <laughs> yeah, it, it is out there if you want to find it. Yeah. One thing I'm still, again, trying to understand is where does where does the Python world see Django fitting in? Because um, my sense is that Django used to be more of a first first pillar of Python, and now it's more of a utility, which is a good thing. I mean, certainly the excitement at PyCon was not around Django; it was around data science and async. I'm curious what your take is on on that. What is you know, because the Python world is so much broader than Django itself. It is, and that's a good thing. Django has proven itself to be a very stable, boring platform on which to work on, which is extremely good because having putting all your eggs in one basket on a beta product and then having that disappear is not good business practice. <laughs> no, it is not. I, <laughs> I've, no. Yeah. Or even one that's just transforming itself so much. I, I spent a year and a half working with Meteor.js, which... Um, was fantastic and I think is still an active framework, but was changing um, more rapidly than our business business needs would have liked at the time. Yeah. And Django itself is so mature and the DSF is in a position where it can fund a person to help be a full-time or part-time or yeah, I'm two, sure Carlton will correct now. me. Yeah, two people. Carlton will correct me on it, but the DSF can now pay someone to work on Django, which is yeah. incredible in itself. The DSF has money to be able to put towards helping conferences happen, towards ensuring that Django continues to exist. And the PSF does that at a larger scale, which is absolutely incredible. But there is still so much more that goes underfunded, unfunded, volunteer yeah. effort. The PSF has a grants program. The DSF has a grants program, but those aren't at the scale that would provide a salary or 12 for professional software engineers to be able to fix all the problems in just one little bit of CPython, for example. Um, <laughs> yep. But that's an entire other conversation. And I highly suggest that you get Dr. Russell Keith McGee on board because he has a lot to say about funding. And if you can't, or if you have only 45 minutes, I strongly suggest you watch his keynote from PyCon 2019 in Cleveland. It is a very good talk. It is. Yeah. I was fortunate enough to be yeah there in the room for it. Um, I was in the front row. <laughs> I was, I was fangirling the entire time. Yeah. Yeah. He's, uh, Sometimes it's hard to make a technical talk interesting, but he never has that problem. He um, will link to that one, but he's given a lot of talks. You should check them all out. Um, so actually, in speaking speaking of Russ, um, you've also done a number of open source stuff, including Beware, um, which um, maybe you could speak a bit about that project and, and your involvement. Yeah, so at my very first PyCon Australia, 
I stuck around for the sprints, the development sprints, which normally tack on to the end of a PyCon where it's a case of everyone has traveled anyway, stay an extra day or two and just jam on things yeah. and muck around with projects or have an actual development sprint and work on a project with people that you may not have met before or with the rest of your open source team. I happened to be at these development sprints and ended up sitting next to Russell and he was mucking around with this thing and I'm asking, well, what was that? Oh, I'm trying to get Python to run in the browser. I'm like, huh, can I try that? Well, no, I haven't got it up on GitHub yet. I'm like, well, could you do that? And then I can try it. And turns out his code wasn't exactly installable at that point, um, but I was able to help debug that because anyone knows it's like it works on my machine is not a good uh, unit test um, <laughs> no unfortunately not but from there after that PyCon in Australia in Brisbane in 2015 I kept in touch with Russell and I helped out a bit with Beware and I ended up seeing him again at Django Con Europe in Budapest where I had received the first challenge coin so oh, what is what is what is what is, what is a challenge coin? If you contribute to the Beware project in any way, it doesn't have to be code, you get a Yak Shaver Challenge coin. It is a um, one and a half inch, very hefty coin made of nickel, um, which has the Beware logo on one side and a Yak on the other. And this has been an amazing factor in getting people interested in our project because people like Shiny and people will contribute to your project for Shiny. Um, but we don't just have one coin. We have a second one. If you help two or more people earn their Yak Shaver coin, you get a Yak Herder coin oh. because we also like our puns. <laughs> and it's the same form factor of coin. It's just that the Yak on the other side is on a wonderful green grass on a beautiful, clear blue sky day. Um, I'm sure that we will also link pictures to these particular beauties in the show notes. Um, but that's part of Russell's attempt to get engagement and also a use case of some of our um, uh, donations and funding support. So a bunch of those pressings were done directly by folks like Travis CI and Max CDN and GitHub giving us money to make coins. But mm. But a pressing of coins is not a developer's salary, sadly. But <laughs> no. it's it but is something. a way to yeah, it is something. And the logarithmic factor in which this has to scale in order to support full time development is math. And well, or maybe it's yeah. or do you think it's maybe? And this is always the issue if if there is a a company or a corporate sponsor who uses it and is able to make a business out of it, and then from that can contribute resources. I mean, that would help, but then of course, let's pick you know some benefactor, they would inevitably want it to be custom to them, right? That seems to be the sort of tension whenever you have um, successful companies using open source softwares, they, they, they wanna use it, but they inevitably want something that may not align with what the broader community directly wants. Exactly. And to take it away from Beware for a moment and go to, say, another large bit of software that is production ready and stable that has helped many businesses make many hundreds of millions of dollars. Django, for example. Throw the some amount bees, of bees on there, Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> there is many, many hundreds of millions of dollars are being made off the backs of volunteer sweat. And there is nearly not enough not nearly enough um, paying it back to that. And I totally get why it's, it's, it's like this is open source software. It's got to be free, right? But there is a point where you need to start thinking about the sustainability of yeah. what you are using to literally make your money. And if you don't secure what you're using <laughs> – you are being negligent. You are not ensuring that the product that you use, that you depend your entire platform on, continues to run. If you do not ensure that that continues to exist, then you have a major liability 
So it's not just a case of kicking back a few hundred bucks to a project. It's a case of being a actual sponsor about giving back in a financial significant way that doesn't just serve your interests, but the interests of the project in general. And I understand this is really not the best thing to be saying when I work for a company that is as big as Google, but it's one of those social things where free and open source software is so new and we're still working out what it all means. And we are... We are seeing now the retirement of some of our founding fathers in this space, like with Guido stepping down. And it's incredible and amazing and fantastic, but also brutal at the same time. And it's, yeah, we live in interesting times. Well, and I think part of the reason for this show is to talk about the, the people behind behind this software because I, I think it is possible and easy to think it's just it just exists on GitHub and things happen, but it's really not my concern, even if you are using a professional setting when in fact, you know, <laughs> there are these volunteers, there are people who, you know, get burned out, there are people who get tired and move on. And um, I mean one thing that I've seen it's interesting the different funding approaches out there. I mean, for example, at PyCon, um, there's a company, Tidelift, actually based in Boston where I am that is trying to do like a subscription for open source stuff. Um, there's even one of my one of my friends. He works in the PHP world, and Laravel is interesting because that's a web framework that is for profit, largely run by one person. And that person, for example, sells a ninety nine dollars, I believe, SaaS off the shelf, you know, like third party app, and that alone contributes greatly to. The community. So it's. I hope that it's a business problem, not not like a culture or social one, to find ways to make open source projects like Django sustainable. Um, but it is interesting seeing what people, other people out there, are doing. I mean, for example, Django. I think last fall, for the first time, had a um, sponsorship with um, JetBrains, where for a month there was some donations. Um, yeah, something needs to be done, but it's it's tricky to balance, as you said, the nonprofit and community aspect with finding a way to get. <laughs> the funding that the project needs to uh, to go on. I, I've just yeah. listed a whole bunch of things. I wonder if any of those <laughs> those that I mentioned uh, to you seem interesting, or if you've heard of other approaches um, that you know make it make e- a combination of easier and also like, oh, we have to do that um, for um, the companies that are using and relying on this software, specifically Django. So the WordPress community does this extraordinarily well. There are multiple people who can survive as an income off WordPress plugins, paid WordPress plugins. Mm, Um, Automatic is an entire company based off this. WordPress have their own hosting models. There is a lot of money going in and out of WordPress. And even though it might seem as someone who has always been able to just download packages for free, maybe if you have to have a subscription, which makes sure that your particular package gets patched, maybe that's not a bad thing. Right. That would be what Tidelift and others are trying to do. Yeah. But I mean, there are like there's Git store, there's... um, There was Git tip. There is so many people trying to spin up these sort of things, but it's always a case of we're software developers. We're not economists. There is. (laughs) Yeah, that's so true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it does take some, some of the, just the magic and the the goodwill of the community away when you put the the business hat on. And I mean, for me, because I, I came from the business world before I got into programming. So the idea of stack overflow that certainly does not exist in the business world. I mean, there's just you, there's no way that someone would freely help you with something. So that's one of the things I I love about engineering. And yeah, you don't want that to go away. I mean, with Python two now being deprecated in 2020, I believe it's Red Hat is going to offer some sort of support for it, but you have to pay for it. The idea being that you're a large company. Do you know more specifics on that? What can I say? What can be recorded? <laughs> well, we, we don't have to get into um, it. <laughs> no, no. It's um, community support for Python 2 is ending and Python 2 will not be community maintained post January 2020. The reality is that enterprises cannot meet that deadline. 
So there are a number of providers who, for a fee, will continue to make sure that Python 2 at least remains with security patches. However, that is a big risk because when the entire community is no longer looking at Python 2, no one's going to be trying to find um, security vulnerabilities anymore. No one is yeah. going to be pushing it as hard as they once did. So we're not going to know if things are still broken. It would be a very, very good idea that if you have any Python 2 code running that you do migrate it to Python 3, preferably before January 2020. <laughs> yep. Yeah. No, Python that's... 3 is very good now. Python 3 is marvelous. Python 3 supports emoji. Please migrate to Python 3. <laughs> well, and to your earlier point about WordPress, we had um, Tom Dyson on who's involved with the Wagtail project. And, you know, something about Django traditionally is it seems it's it wasn't used as much for agencies um, in the way that certainly WordPress is. But with Wagtail, that's, I think, Jan uh, Wagtail is the second most popular um, third-party project now. Um, that really is becoming a use case. And so that might be a way that it's easier for Django to look at, I guess, some of these WordPress um, monetization techniques, though, as, as we, as you've said, um, there is a danger there in losing the magic of open source. One of the funding models that can work well for some demographics is we will give you the code. You can spin it up yourself if you have the resources, but if you don't, here, pay yeah. us and we'll do it for you. What would be an example? I mean, an example, I mean, beyond WordPress that Django could look to for that because I think with Python there's starting to be some of this. There's, I mean, Python Anywhere has this, um, Replit has this. Are there other good examples out there of in the Python world of people doing hosted options? Divio. <laughs> Divio. <laughs> I know I I don't have personal experience with Divio, which is why it doesn't come top of mind to me. But yeah, um, Divio. Divio has their own opinionated. Django called Aldrin, and you can find it on their GitHub repo, and you can host it yourself, or you could pay them to host it for you, and then you can just focus on the code. You can also use Django CMS and host yep. it all yourself, or you could pay them and they will host it for you, and then you don't have to worry about having to do all that. Which sounds nice, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so how does that? Uh, I I haven't heard of that. The Alter Django? How, do, how does that work? Uh, sorry, Aldrin. Aldrin. As in, as in Buzz Aldrin. Um, oh, okay. Oh, sorry. I should say Django CMS. Aldrin Django is their code name for their opinionated Django, which works in their setup. But they made Django CMS, and they will host Django CMS for you with a... Uh, you can go on to a URL that I can't remember right now, and it will spin up a copy of Django CMS for you, give you 15 minutes on it, and if you like what you see, you can click continue and pay for that particular instance to continue for you. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, but Django CMS is also a free and open source project, but for a small fee and probably cheaper than what it would cost you in engineering hours, they will host it for you. Yeah. And, and so that seems very much geared towards agencies, but is that incorrect? They're also hard, um, well, maybe startups as well, larger companies, because that's the, at least my perception is that at a certain point, people need to go custom in the past. But um, certainly, well, you're, you're at Google now. I mean, Google, <laughs> that's not the case if you use Google. Um, the Django CMS and Divio product, if you go onto their webpage, um, there's a really cool... <laughs> <laughs> they rebranded less um agencies can use it which with it which is a case of i know how to use django cms i just want a new one mm -hmm. it also scales to enterprise because divio have expert devops people behind the scenes who can make sure that your stuff will scale um and it can also just be for the developer because it comes pre-configured with Django CMS or Wagtail or Oscar um, out of the box. And so if you don't want to have to worry about the hosting, you can pay someone to host it for you. However, not everyone has that as a valid business model. Yes, well said. Well, personally speaking, I don't like doing DevOps, so I'm happy to 
pay a bit of money and not have to <laughs> deal with all this myself. Um, but it is a uh, not everyone feels that way. Are there uh, things we haven't talked about that you want to cover? PyCon Australia is happening in August in Sydney. Uh, tickets will be on sale at the beginning of June. And if you happen to like the thought of coming to Australia, perhaps convince your boss that you should learn more about Django and Python by going to a conference in Australia. The weather's nice and there are no drop bears in the CBD. And there's uh, and there what one day of that conference will be dedicated to to Django? Is it is the, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so Django Con Australia is a legit Django Con, but it happens to be a one day single track event, which we've rolled up into PyCon Australia. Your ticket will cover access to both events and also any other talk at the conference. Great. Awesome. Well, we will link to that, of course. Um, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your experiences in the Python and Django worlds. No worries. Thank you for having me. All right. Bye. Bye.